In some languages, Psalms 9 and 10 are a single psalm. That's the case for the ancient Greek translation. Um, I don't know if it's the case for Polish, it's the case for Russian. Um, and in fact, so, it, so that means that he puts the numbering out of the rest of the Psalms until you get to Psalm 147, which is um, the other way around uh, in, in English Bibles. So um, uh, all these various languages have 150 Psalms in total, but don't always um, divide them up the same way, uh, which is quite interesting. This, 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 um, these pair of Psalms actually go through the Hebrew alphabet um, across the two Psalms, not, not, not entirely, and so that makes us think that they're probably a, a pair to go together. Um, uh, and one, one phrase that occurs in both psalms is the phrase times of trouble. It's there in verse 9 of our psalm that's just been read to us. And it's there in, in ver the first verse of Psalm 10. Like many psalms then, Psalms 9 and 10 are written in the context of times of trouble. Now we're not going to look deeply into that this evening, but it's, it's just interesting to note that. Jesus told us to expect such times, not to fear them, there's a wonderful verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, uh, which is a great encouragement, where Jesus says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Uh, so you're about to suffer, but don't fear. And that's, that's a great encouragement. So we're not to fear um, these things that, that come upon the church, but nor are we to be surprised by them. Um, you can see, for example, 1 John 3, verse 13. The church has gone through times of trouble in many times in history and still in many places today. And that was clear from, from the prayers that we've just been praying as well. When the church of God goes through times of trouble, what is her comfort? What does she hold on to? Well, various things, but I think three things would be that the Lord rules forever on his throne, victorious over all who hate him, like we've thought about just from the Exodus. That he deals justly with those who hate him and he ends their tyranny. And thirdly, that the church has a faithful saviour who will redeem her from all adversity. Now we see these things celebrated in this psalm. I don't know if you're feeling any sense of going through times of trouble. You may do, uh, you may not. But either way, may the preaching of the themes of this psalm be a blessing to each of us this evening. We're going to walk through then some of the themes found particularly in the first half of this psalm. Um, I didn't particularly plan it that way, but it's just there are so many things, there are so many rich things in this psalm, but it's basically the first half that we're going to be looking at tonight. Firstly, that God reigns forever on his heavenly throne. This is both a great truth and a great comfort to the believer. And of course it's denied by unbelievers, but that doesn't change the truth of it. God is still reigning even when unbelievers deny the truth of it. The truth of it is declared though here, in verse 7, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And we also see it in verse 4. For you, says the psalmist, for you, praying to God, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne, giving righteous judgment. And also verse 11. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the, people, uh, among the peoples his deeds. So these three verses speak of God's throne and God sitting on it. There's something very permanent, something very in control about God sitting on his throne. It speaks of his absolute, absolute sovereignty over all things. The nations are in uproar and uh, we see that Psalm 2, we see it in Psalm 46, uh, the, the, the mountains swirling and, the, and uh, everything falling into the heart of the sea, the kingdoms tottering, the world's in turmoil. But God is just on his throne. God is sitting, ruling, reigning on his throne, totally in control, totally in authority over all things in heaven and on earth. I was thinking the other day about how the very opening verse of the Bible tells us that the God it speaks about is the God of everything. The God, from the very beginning of the Bible, it tells us that this is no local deity we're dealing with here. This is the God of everything, the God of heaven and earth. The God who made heaven and earth. And so he, as we're thinking now, he not only made it, but he sits enthroned over all things in heaven and on earth. Now the particular aspect in view that this we have in this psalm is that the Lord sits enthroned over all the forces that are hostile against him, that are set up in defiance of him. The Lord sits enthroned 
over all of them, over those who hate him, those who seek to destroy his people, over those who act wickedly in every way. The Lord is enthroned over them. Now that is a great truth for God's glory. It's also a great comfort for the church of God. It stirs the praise of God's people that he is Lord over Pharaoh. That's why there was that great celebration in Exodus 15 that we read earlier. It stirs the praise of God's people that he is Lord over the Egyptians. It stirs the praise of God's people that he's Lord over the Goliath. Do you remember they had, again, a similar dancing and praising. David kill, uh, uh, killed his thousands. Uh, Saul has killed his thousands. David is tens of thousands. And they're praising God that he's done this through, uh, through David. It's to stir the praise of God's people that, that, that God is Lord over Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. Aren't we meant to have our hearts stirred by that contest on Mount Carmel as the prophets of Baal fail? Of course we are. This God we're dealing with is Lord over Nebuchadnezzar, Lord over the Babylonians, Lord over Haman. I was reading Haman this week in Esther. Lord over that irrevocable law of the Medes and Persians that Haman smuggled into their laws that was set to destroy entirely God's people. God is Lord over Haman and his irrevocable laws. And of course, our God is Lord over the archdemon himself, over Satan the devil, who held us in his grip until Christ came and freed us by his death on the cross. Christ rode out victoriously and has made a public spectacle of all the rulers and authorities and cosmic powers and spiritual forces against God. Christ, in the words of one of the other Psalms, Christ is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. This is our God, this is our Saviour. He's the conqueror who sits enthroned at God's right hand until the day when every tongue confesses that he is Lord and every knee bows before him, even those that pierced him. So it's greatly to the glory of our God and the rejoicing of his people that God is sovereign over all, including those that hate him. He is sovereign over them too. Verses 1 and 2, let me just read those. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult, that means rejoice, in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So see there the wholehearted, joy-filled thanks and praise of David here. He rejoices that God is the Most High. Not the somewhere on the ladder, but the Most High. The Most High over all. Verse 11, see the joy there. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Again, the heart of the psalmist is filled with the praises of of the Lord. The Lord reigns. That comes in another psalm. Two psalms. Psalm 97, Psalm 99. The Lord reigns. He reigns over all. That's good news for all his people. Second thing I want to look at from this psalm is the future judgment that God's eternal lordship entails. What we've just been thinking about, about God's lordship over all who hate him, all who ignore and deny and reject him, might beg the question, well, well, how can people seem to get away with it with impunity? Eastbourne's full of people who have no time to come and worship God, who have no thought of the God that made them. Well, this answers the question about that. And the answer is that there is no impunity for those who live like that. There is no impunity. There's a day to come when God will judge the world in righteousness. And that's spoken of here in verse 8. And he judges the world, or he will judge the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. Now, I think the first half of that verse that I just read is the only verse in this psalm that is directly alluded to in the New Testament. I think that's the case. There may be other verses that are quoted in the New Testament, but this one certainly is. um, And it's there in Acts 17. So just keep your finger in Psalm, Psalm 9 and we'll... Go to Acts 17 to see it there. It's on page 927, Acts 17, verse uh, 30 and 31. This is Paul in Athens, in the Areopagus, speaking to, to pagans. Verse 30 and 31. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent 
because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, there it is, by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So do you see here, this is using the words of Psalm 9 and adding that this judgment is going to happen by the man that God has appointed. And we know who that man is because that is the one man that God has raised from the dead to imperishable life, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a day coming when Christ will come again in glory and he will come with all the angels of heaven. And he will sit on his judgment throne and judge the world, judge the living and the dead. And in Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42, it says this, Christ will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This then is a day to be ready for when Christ comes in glory, sits on the judgment throne, and judges the nations, judges every single one of us. Back in our psalm, back in Psalm 9, we see how the fate of those who are not saved on that day when Christ returns. We see how their fate is described in verses 5 and 6. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an, everla- uh, to an end in everlasting ruins, Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. I don't know if you noticed when Elaine read it, but perish is a repeated word in this psalm. That's what the wicked will receive from God on that day. Perishing everlastingly. And of course, that is why the Bible speaks so much about salvation. This is what we need salvation from. Salvation from perishing everlastingly. We all need this because we've all sinned. The sin of Adam, as it were, runs in our bloodstream, runs in our DNA. We all have evil hearts from which all manner of sin comes. And I I don't know if you see that in your heart, but I certainly see it in mine. I, I hope you see it in your heart because it's there in your heart just as much as it's in mine. But the good news is that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, he gave his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, will not do what this psalm says, will not perish everlastingly under God's judgment, but rather have everlasting life. If it were not for Christ's merciful first coming, no one would be saved, because we are all without righteousness. We all have hearts that just pour forth evil continually. We're all by nature in the category that the, that the Psalms calls the wicked. And it comes in our passage. The wicked. The wicked that deserve to perish. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is free forgiveness. There is the free gift of righteousness for all who will repent of their sin and seek refuge and salvation in Christ. The psalmist wants to recount all of the Lord's wonderful deeds, verse 1, second half of verse 1. So how can we therefore not recount this most wonderful of deeds when the Lord Jesus Christ came into our world to give his life on the cross as an unblemished substitute in our place, the perfect sacrifice for sins. This is the greatest of all the Lord's wonderful deeds. He who is the judge of all on that final day, he came into this world and perished on the cross, willingly in our place, willingly for the sins of his people, to suffer in his own body the the punishment for the sins of his people. And he rose again in glory and power to be our righteousness, so that all who trust in Christ for salvation are counted as righteous before God and no longer as sinners. Our God is perfect in righteousness. He reigns in righteousness and justice. But he's also a God who is rich in mercy. And so there is abounding forgiveness. And there is freely bestowed righteousness for all who take refuge from the Lord Jesus Christ from the coming day of judgment. This is the gospel. 
This is the central message of love that is there in the Bible from beginning to end. And it's the joy and glorious hope of a believer. And I want every born again believer here tonight to rejoice and praise God for these things. I want you to glory in these things. I want your hearts to be stirred. I want my heart to be stirred like the, heart, like the, um, the psalmist seeking to stir his own heart to praise and thanksgiving. I also want to be as helpful as I possibly can to any here tonight who are not in the happy state of the person who's been born again by the Spirit of God. You see, it might be possible to hear the message so far and conclude, I'm a sinner, but God has sent a saviour, so I'm all right then. And that would be a catastrophic conclusion to reach. That would be to go away with a false assurance. A truly saved person is never assured that they're okay as they are. Now we thought about this this morning, but we'll just think about it more this evening. Jesus said in John 3, 7, that you must be born again. I must be born again. We all must be born again. Jesus said that. A person needs to be born again inwardly so that they earnestly turn to God in contrition and confession and repentance and seek the forgiveness that we, that we need and that, that is there through, through Christ. Now, the terminology of being born again is not found in our psalm, but something of the character of it is found in our psalm. And this is something to tease out whenever we find it. And so that's what I just want to do now. It's there, something of the character of, of a born-again person is found in verses 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Now, in fact, in verse 10, there are, I think, three descriptions of uh, of the person who's saved by the Lord, the person who is born again. And it's the, the three things are, know your name, they, they know your name, they, they trust in you and they seek you. They know the Lord's name, they trust in the Lord and they seek the Lord. Now I just want to think about the first of those, know your name, they know your name, O oh Lord. That's speaking about something more than just a trivial knowledge of what God's name is it's speaking of a deep personal love and affection for the lord such that the person delights to belong to the lord to, and delights to have him as their god what does it mean then to know the lord's name well i think we can let me just give you a few old testament passages that will help us with this i think Psalm 119, verse 132 says this. It's not using quite the same terminology, but it's maybe slightly parallel terminology. Psalm 119, verse 132. Turn to me and be gracious to me, says the psalmist, as is your way with those who love your name. So someone who knows the Lord's name, according to Psalm 9, is someone who loves the Lord's name, according to Psalm 119, verse 132. Somebody who loves the Lord's name. Or a verse that we had this morning, Isaiah 45, uh, sorry, 44, verse 5. Isaiah 44, verse 5. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call, call on the name of Jacob, and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. So someone who knows the Lord's name isn't, isn't just someone who loves the Lord's name, it's someone who loves to belong to the Lord, loves to have the Lord, Lord's name written on them, as it were, and to, to be his. Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. That's what we're talking about here. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Or listening, okay, listen to the first four verses of Song of Solomon. You may like to turn there. It's on page 560. The opening four verses of Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, 
For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. The born again are a people in love. That's what this is telling us. There are people in love. That's what Song of Solomon's about. The church is a bride who is head over heels about her bridegroom. That's what a born again person is like. They are a person in love. A person who loves their Savior. A person who loves Christ. So the church, Christ's name is as oil poured out. So some of you will have ointment or perfume poured out. That's what the name of Christ is to those who are born again to a new life in him. So do you see then the beautiful character and nature of a born-again heart? No one can take credit for it. It's, it's entirely beauty that's birthed by God alone. We, we thought about that this morning. It's just a work of God when he, bought, when he, he, he uh, rebirths a person. Now, even those who are born again here this evening, you might well be hearing what I'm saying here uh, with a sense of wretchedness. And I feel that, uh, maybe you do as well, a, a sense that I don't love Christ like that. My Christ isn't, my, my love for him is, isn't, well, I get glimpses of that in me, but, but I, I just fall so sh- far short of that. Well, yes, we do see glimpses of this love, love for Christ birthed in us, don't we, if, if we're born again. But we also see how it needs to be stoked. We also see how, how lacking it is, how, how inadequate it is, how patchy it is. If you're born again, you love Christ, but you feel the poverty of your love. And know it needs to grow. But the point is this. A born-again person, in other words, the person who is redeemed from perishing, has a love for Christ implanted in them. A love for Christ as their Savior. To save them from all the judgment of God that their sin deserves. A born-again person loves Christ. His name is as oil poured out to them. Once they loved their sin... That's what we were all like once. We wallowed in it. We gloried in it. But now a born-again person has a new love. They love their Savior instead of their sin. And they glory in him. Philippians, beginning of Philippians, chapter 3. They glory in Christ Jesus. And count all else as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. We've looked at a number of themes this evening. I want to, ad- to draw to a close on this last theme that we've looked at. Just a few things. Would you have your love for Christ stoked? Would you have love for Christ fanned into flame? Well then, pursue all the means that God has given us for this. What can we do to stoke love for Christ in our hearts? We can do this. We can dig God's word for the treasures of Christ that are to be mined there on every single page. Blend it with prayer and commune closely with your Savior as you dig God's word for Christ and the grace of the gospel and blend it all with prayer. And he shows you and shows you the treasures of Christ that there are there. Don't neglect opportunities to meet, uh, to meet for Christian fellowship. That's just an obvious one, isn't it? We can so easily neglect that, though, can't we? Why not start coming to the prayer meeting if you don't? Tuesday night, 7.30. Read helpful Christian literature. We have a resources table out there on your left as you leave, groaning under the weight of helpful things, good things that will show you the treasures of Christ. David has chosen them well. I'm really impressed. You know, David, David, David has really done a very good job in the resources table out there. It's all free. Use those things. They are good things. They will stoke your love for Christ. Keep at least one good Christ-adoring Christian book on the go all the time. Maybe that if you if you're lacking New Year's resolutions, maybe that might be a good one. I'm, I'm assuming that. Well, maybe I shouldn't assume, but but make sure you read the Bible. 
as well. Never think that uh, you can read a Christian book instead of reading the Bible itself. They are different things. We need both of them. When we read the Bible, we are encountering Christ face to face, as it were. When we read a Christian book, we are, as it were, hearing admirers of our Savior, admiring Him, drawing out thoughts that we may not have had before. It's a different thing. We need them both. So make sure that you read the Bible. And if you've got that set in stone, as it were, in your day, and you dig the treasures of Christ prayerfully every day, then add this as a, as a, as a New Year's resolution. Keep a good Christ-adoring Christian book on the go all the time. You can start with the resources table, and if you run out of things there, there are plenty of other things that I could recommend. So, 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 so do make use of these things. We want to be people that love Christ, don't we? And as uh, those of us who are born again this evening, we want to be stoking the fires of our love for Christ. We want his name to be like um, the oil poured out for us, don't like ointment to our, to our senses, like, like just beautiful. And we get glimpses of that, but we want to grow in that, don't we? And if you're not yet born again and all of this is strange to you this evening, then come to Christ and ask him for it. Ask, seek, and knock is what he tells us to do. Ask, seek, and knock. And plead that he will give you these things for himself. And he will not reject any, will not turn away any that come to him to do that in repentance and faith. Well, let's pray that the Lord would bless to us the things that we've been thinking about this evening. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we've, we've looked at various things from our psalm tonight. And... Uh, Maybe one thing or particular things have struck us more than others. Whatever things have been helpful for us tonight, Heavenly Father, may we take those things away. May we, if need be, write them down and, and, and uh, make uh, prayerful resolutions uh, from, uh, of anything that we would be uh, good to, to take away from this evening. Father, your people here tonight, we, I'm sure I speak for all of us, say we want our love for Christ to grow. We want his name to be more precious to us. We want to count all things lost compared to this, uh, because of this surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. So just make the fragrance of Christ's name more and more precious to us. May we not neglect to do the very basic things of digging, mining your word for the treasures of Christ to be found there. May we daily encounter him over this coming week. May we daily encounter him in our prayers. And Father, may we uh, benefit from those who've walked the Christian walk and written things down that are helpful and edifying and wonderful and glorious to read of our Saviour. May we make good use of the many resources that we have, especially uh, in the English language. We are very spoiled in, in that regard. So Father, may we, at the start of this new year then, uh, feed uh, our love for Christ, and grow in the grace and knowledge of him. We pray in his name. Amen.